Uh, so you keep that passage open with, in front of you, and uh, you have a talk notes also where you be given when you came in, so you can see where we're going, and if you want to take notes as well. Let's pray before we dive in. Father, we praise you that you're a God who makes yourself known. Thank you, that's your desire through all of the Bible, especially this book of Exodus. Please, Father, make yourself known to us today. Reveal to us who you are, how you work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been uh, backstage or like behind the scenes at something? Uh, maybe you've been part of a, a production of some sorts and you, so you've seen the kind of inner workings. Or maybe you've, um, uh, on holiday, we, we went on a ferry and we were kind of looking through at the bridge to try and see what was happening. You can not really actually see much. We didn't get to go on it. Uh, but maybe you kind of see the kitchen behind the restaurant. Have you seen something like that? Because out front, in the, the audience or on the boat or whatever, you, you see what you're meant to see. You, 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 you see the slick presentation, the, um, the fine meal, the boat going where it should. Uh, but when you get to go backstage, you get to see all the hidden stuff. You get to see how things work. What's going on to make everything else happen. Exodus 2 is a bit like a trip backstage. It's a trip that takes us back to help us to see what's going on. Because on the stage, as it were, we saw from last week that things were very bleak for God's people. We saw that as this family was emerging and growing into a nation, they grew and grew and grew, which was wonderful, except fearful Pharaoh didn't like it. And so he put them into slavery to try and stop their growth. But that had the opposite effect. In fact, they grew all the more. So he brought in this plan of infanticide. Kill the baby boys. So you can imagine the horror and the bitterness, the tragedy that was life for God's people back then. Day after day, getting up, back-breaking toil in the boiling hot sun. And you know, those moments of, of joy of pregnancy, suffocated by fear. Is it going to be a boy? Is it going to be thrown into the Nile? Well, chapter 2, though, uh, gives us this glimpse behind the scenes to see God beginning to work out his rescue plan. Okay, he, as he raises up his rescuer, and as we see his heart for his people. So we start off, I uh, don't know if yeah, they are, that one's working, um, or it's on your hand out there. The first thing we see is rescuing the rescuer. Because God is raising up the man who he is going to use to rescue his people from their bitter slavery. But at the beginning of chapter 2, the plan's almost over before it starts. So at the beginning of chapter 2, you have these two Levites, people descended from Levi. They get married, they get pregnant, they joy of that. But as I said, that suffocating fear. And yes, this is a baby boy. This, this boy is facing death. But they manage to hide him for three months. Now, if you've had children, you think you didn't sleep well for three months. I certainly feel like I didn't sleep well for three months and indeed a lot longer. Could you imagine that? The slightest cry. Quick shot, quick, quick. <laughs> make it quiet, make it quiet. Hide in this. The, the anxiety for those three long months. Well, but the time came when the parents could hide him no longer. And so they come up with a plan. Have a look down at verse 3. When she, that's this baby's mother, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and um, daubed, how do you say that word? Daub, daubed, 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 thank you. Daubed it with, it's one of you read, sorry. He daubed it with bitter, uh, bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. Now, what, what desperation to, leave, to lead a mother to do that, to put a baby in a basket in the river. And we might assume what fear led to that desperation. But actually, this event is commented on 
in the New Testaments. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, which is that great chapter of faith. And this is said about Moses' parents' actions. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You catch that? They were not afraid of the king's edict. Their faith was stronger than their fear. They trusted in a sovereign God, and so they entrusted their baby into his hands. They had faith that God was more important than Pharaoh. So, in the baby, who we know as Moses, goes. But Moses' mother is joined by Moses' sister in this plan. Uh, Most likely this is Miriam, um, who we'll hear uh, hear about again through the book of Uh, of Exodus. We don't know, but probably somewhere between the ages of about 6 and 12, you know, old enough to have a a conversation uh, in a foreign language, but yet not old enough to be expected to work. But here she is. She is keeping an eye on Moses in this basket. And then the most remarkable thing happens, verse 5. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. Now we might, if we just pause there, if we didn't know the story, we might think this is almost the very worst person who could possibly find this baby. Because you remember from chapter 1, verse 22, uh, Pharaoh is given this edict, every son that is born to the Hebrews shall be cast into the Nile. She, Pharaoh's sons of all, uh, she, Pharaoh's daughter of all people, would be expected just to simply tip up this little basket. But verse six, when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, "This is one of the Hebrews' children. She, she couldn't do it." She heard the baby's cry, she, she saw this little baby, and she couldn't do it. She had pity. And Pharaoh's daughter's compassion then is followed very quickly by Miriam's quick thinking. Verse 7, that then the sister, you know, who's seen all this, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Good thinking. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And so the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away, nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. I'm sure you caught the irony of of all this, didn't you? You Pharaoh wanted all the baby boys to be thrown into the Nile. Well, Moses' mother puts him in the Nile. Pharaoh wanted to kill all the baby boys, and yet Pharaoh's own daughter has compassion and saved one. And not only that, but then saved him, gave him back to his own mother, and what's more, paid her to raise this child. And not only that, but once the baby was weaned, well, he was going to be adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, brought into the royal family, to have that long-term security and status. We want to ask Pharaoh, how's your plan going? How's it going, Pharaoh? Now, through these verses, God isn't mentioned explicitly, but his work is surely unmissable there. You know, all these coincidences. Oh, Pharaoh's daughter happened to be bathing there. All these coincidences leads into that irony, irony so clearly, so clearly God's hand. His parents' faith is well placed. But there is one big clue which confirms the Lord's hand in this. It's hidden, unfortunately, in most English translations. But let me read verse 3 again and just see if you, your, your Genesis bells are ringing. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a ark, she took for him a ark made of bulrushes. Da, 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 da. An ark. It's the only time 
outside of Noah and those few chapters in Genesis that this, we find this word. You see, the, the original readers would immediately have gone, ah, here is God's hand, just like he saved Noah and his family and the animals by an ark from death. So here the Lord is saving Mo- uh, Moses by an ark from death. See here, God is rescuing his rescuer. He's raising him up. Then we see the next series, in the next section, we see him preparing this rescuer. Okay, uh, having been rescued at birth, which we've just seen in verses 1 to 10, well, we skip about 40 years. And although uh, Moses has been adopted into this Egyptian royalty, he's definitely not forgotten who he is. Have a look down at verse 11 and again, see how it's emphasized. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. One of his people. Moses knows who he is. He hasn't forgotten who he is. And he is concerned about his people. And so he wanted to go and see what was going on. Whether this was the first time it happened or whether he, he regularly did this, we don't know. But he stirred right into action. See verse 12. He, uh, yeah, he, he, Moses, looked this way and that. And seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. I think we're meant to be a little bit unsettled here. Did you get it? He looked this way and that. It's, just, it's slightly suspicious, isn't it? He kills this Egyptian and he buries him in the sand. And we see the result of it. Verse 13. Because when, the, when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. The the, the people, they've had enough of killing kings, haven't they? And here's Moses, and it's become known somehow what he did, and the Hebrew doesn't want anything to do with him. Now again, you you spot the irony in this statement if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, because a prince and a judge over the people is exactly what God makes Moses. But that was later. Later. At this stage, he's he's rejected by his own people. Moses is afraid. And indeed, Pharaoh finds out in verse 15, and so Moses skips town. Again, I wonder, what are we to make of this? In some sense, this is good, isn't it? Moses, he, he cares about his people. He's bold. He takes action. And yet, He's a bit naive. And what's he going to do? Is he going to take out the Egyptians one at a time? But again, Hebrews 11 gives us an insight into Moses' thinking here. It says he was acting by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. You see, he was acting by faith. He, he, he gave up a lot to identify with his people. He, he went from living in the royal household to fleeing to a place outside in Midian. He went from the privileges that would have come from being in that royal household of, of, one, of the, if one of, if not the most important nation on earth at that time, to go to obscurity in the Sinai wilderness. Now, looking on, we might think, well, he's made some bad choices to go from that to that. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says he acted by faith. And in fact, this event is also mentioned one other time in the New Testament. 
In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is speaking to the, to the Jews and um, just before he gets killed by them, and, and Stephen highlights the ways throughout their history repeatedly rejected God's prophets. And his point is that, well, you've rejected Jesus too. But, but here's what he says about Moses. Here's the example. When he, Moses, was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptians. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hands. But they did not understand. See that insight to Moses thinking? He thought that the people would understand that God was going to bring salvation through Moses. But they didn't. They rejected him. They didn't understand. And so Moses ends up fleeing to Midian. So in one sense, the rescuer is being prepared, but actually, in another sense, well, the rescued are being prepared. At this stage, they didn't want anything to do with Moses. But there in Midian, in verse 16, well, once again, his protective instincts kicked in. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered the flock. Seeing the injustice, he can't handle himself. He intervenes once again. And then when the girls go back to their father, uh, Moses ends up being invited for a meal. It's a meal which which leads to marriage. And it's marriage that leads to a child. So in verse 22, um, she, that's Zipporah, uh, Moses' now wife, she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. That's Moses. He's, he's gone from this, from possibly the palace, from the royal family, and he's now out in obscurity, a foreigner. It's an intriguing section, I find this. You've got Moses, in one sense, this man of conviction, this, this man of compassion, this man of boldness. But in another sense, this, this moment of, do you want to say it is impulsive action, leads to exile and a further 40 years, 40 years in Midian for him and 40 years more slavery for the people. For God's people, it's years and years and years of bitter slavery, waiting. Moses his first crack at deliverance where it doesn't go very well. There were things that needed to happen before both the rescuer and the rescued were ready. But then at the end of chapter 2, we, come, we, we, we zoom out. and In fact, we go back to Egypt and we're given this insight into God's heart and his mind while these events are going on. Have a look down at verse 23 because they start with a glimmer of hope. During these many days... The king of Egypt died. Ooh. This, this Pharaoh who's so anti um, God's people and anti Moses, he's died. But things don't improve. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery. And they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. Now, their, their slavery continues, their bitterness, their hard work. But here is another indication that things might be about to change for the people. Because what are they doing? They're crying out to God. You see the words that are used to describe that in verse 23? They groaned. That they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue. But more than simply telling us about what the people were doing. It tells us about God. Have a look at verse 24. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. 
and he uses some of the most wonderful verses, some of the most wonderful verbs to describe what God was doing there. He heard, he remembered. Now that's, in the Bible, it's not to say that he'd forgotten. He was like, oh yeah, of course, my people. It's not, uh, to remember in the Bible is to, to move towards the object of that memory. So, so what, what did God remember? He remembered his covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, that promise to give them a land, to make them a great nation, to be their God and to, to bless them. He remembered that covenant, and so he's moving towards, working towards that. So God heard their cries, he remembered his covenant, he saw, and God knew. God is getting ready to act. So much of what happens in in chapter 2 is getting us ready, is preparing us for this rescuer. He's raising up the rescuer, and now we see God's heart for his people. And indeed, there are so many pointers towards it too. There, there are, there are um, some subtle uses of the language which are then echoed through the rest of the book that highlights that he's getting us ready for this rescue. I don't know if it, oh, it is, has come up there. Brilliant. It's not showing on my phone. But, but some of the, the language that we find used through this chapter is echoed. I'm sorry, I can't actually see it there. But um, this is why you write it in your own notes as well. Uh, when Moses saw the mistreatment of um, the Egyptian, well, later on, God is described as seeing, it's the same word, seeing the suffering of his people. And when Moses struck down that slave, well, that same word is used of what God does in striking down uh, in the Passover. Then what Moses did to the, to, for the, um, the daughters of, of Jethro, he saved them. Again, echoed in the language of what God does to his people, he saves them. And then the daughters, when they're talking to their father, they, they say how Moses delivered them and how later Jethro, their father, is going to talk about the deliverance of God's people from slavery. All these ways through this chapter, we're being prepared for the rescue that's coming. And indeed, as it points to the rescue that's coming in Exodus, well, it's pointing us to the rescuer, to to the great rescuer. It's pointing us to the rescuing work of Jesus. And again, I don't know if you, as things were going, whether you had bells going off in the echoes of what happened to Moses and the similarities with Jesus. And Jesus, how from birth, faced the same thing as Moses, didn't he? He faced a tyrannical king who ordered all the baby boys should be killed. Jesus' parents believed, though, so they fled to Egypt. And then just as God rescued Moses, um, rescued Moses to rescue his people, well, so God rescues Jesus from that tyrannical king in order to rescue his people. When the human rescue looked impossible, when the the world's power looked too strong and impressive, and God's people looked so vulnerable, God cared. And God had a plan that couldn't be thwarted. Jesus, like Moses, left his privileged position as a son of the king. He left that power and authority and riches and came to earth. He came to be identified, to be mistreated with his people. And yet when Jesus came onto the scene to help his people, his people didn't recognize him. They were suspicious. They rejected him, just like Moses. And yet Jesus came to rescue his people from a a wicked tyrant and brutal Slavery, to deliver them from something even worse than physical slavery. Because Jesus, when he was ministering, said, Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave. He's saying that every single human being who's ever been born has naturally been born into slavery, to a brutal tyrant who wants complete control and only to harm and ultimately only to lead to death. Now that sound, might sound a very extreme description of sin. Yeah, but just think perhaps to, to a time in the past when you 
when you tried to perhaps kick a bad habit and how hard that was and the pull that kept going back to it, that, that's just a, a tiny snapshot into the power of sin, the, uh, the power of the slavery of sin. But Jesus came to identify with his people in slavery. He suffered and died. He paid the penalty of sin, which therefore freed from the power of sin. You, you see, this, the, the rescue which is pointed to in Exodus chapter 2 points us to the ultimate and best rescue in the Lord Jesus. I wonder this morning whether you're newish to Christian things and, and maybe you're despairing at the moment. You know there's a problem. You know you've understood there's this this problem of sin and yet you've been trying to fight it on your own, trying to set yourself free by yourself and you're trying so hard but you found it impossible. Well, that's no surprise. Actually, what the Israelites do in verse 23 and and verse 23 is is what we are to do, to cry out. It's not something we can do for ourselves. We need the rescuer to set us free. To come to Jesus and say, I recognize I've got this problem. Please set me free. And maybe you have been saved and you, you, you think back to uh, those, that slavery that you're in and what great rejoicing it reminds us of as we see these snapshots of rescue through this chapter pointing us to the best rescue that we enjoy. So where are we at the end of chapter 2? Yes, we have the depths of despair for God's people. It's approaching 400 years. 400 years in Egypt, in slavery. But we've gone backstage this morning. We've seen God's heart for his people. And God has been at work. He's started this rescue plan. Now, yes, it looks like everything is going wrong for God's people. It's empty and it's dark. But we know that God saw, heard, remembered, and knew. We knew that actually God was already starting his rescue plan even before his people were crying out to him. Yes, they're suffering. But we can conclude from this chapter that God is sovereignly working. Now, for God's people through the Old Testament, time and again, in their trouble and difficulties, they they were waiting. They were waiting for God to come and work this rescue. And for God's people through the Old Testament, this reminds us that that waiting may sometimes go on a very long time. But God still is at work, and he does care. You see his heart. But as I've already alluded to, for us Christians now, the great rescue has already happened. The waiting is over. But remember that God is the same God. You know, even today in our different troubles of various kinds, God hears our cries. He knows our pain. We wait for deliverance, but we wait with faith because we know that God is the God who who works behind the scenes, who cares for his people. Now, we don't know when those things are going to change, but we can have confidence in the God who does hear no, remember, and no, his people suffering. Let's pray. God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenants. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Father, we thank you that you are a God of compassion, a God of commitments to your people. We praise you that even uh, though things, uh, appearances um, might, might look like things are out of control and it might look like evil powers are having their way, yet we thank you for the confidence that we can have. Lord, we pray that we would trust you in those times. We thank you for the great rescue that this is all pointing to. Lord, please would our appreciation and trust the Lord Jesus be growing and growing and growing through this book. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.